So welcome everyone to this, the fifth CNCF webinar. Today we have William Morgan from Buoyant. He'll be telling us about one of the CNCF's newer projects, Linkerd. Um, previously, if you've been on this webinars before, you will know that we had questions at the end, but we tried out having questions throughout the last time round, and it was a lot of fun. So we're gonna go with that again this time. If you have questions during William's webinar, please drop them in either the Q&A box or the chat window down at the bottom, and I'll find opportune moments to interrupt William. Uh, William, ready to go? I'm ready, let's, let's make it fun. Take it away. All right, so uh, I'm here today to talk about, to talk about Linkerd, uh, which as Mark said, is one of the newest projects uh, in the Cloud Native Computing Foundation. Uh, I work at a company called Buoyant. Uh, I'm going to be doing the webinar today, but I actually uh, don't do a lot of programming anymore. Um, most of my job involves talking. Um, but if you're going to Cloud Native uh, Con in Berlin uh, later this month, or if you are um, going to be uh, anywhere in the Berlin area, my co-founder Oliver, who uh, is a primary uh, contributor and, and, and maintainer of Linkerd, will be there. He'll be doing a couple things there. So he'll be giving a, uh, a Linkerd keynote. He'll be giving uh, a a, uh, he'll be hosting a salon, a Linkerd salon, which uh, is going to be kind of hands-on training, so you can learn how to use Linkerd from, you know, straight from the horse's mouth. Uh, and he'll also be giving a talk uh, with Oliver Beatty from Monzo about how Monzo has built their entire bank around Linkerd. So that's a little pitch for uh, for KubeCon and Cloud Native Con coming up. All right, but let's get started. So uh, the project is called Linkerd, and at the very end, I'm going to try and do a live demo. Uh, we'll we'll see we'll see what happens. Um, Okay, so Linkerd, most important thing is you have to pronounce it with the D because that's separate. Uh, it's an open source service mesh for cloud native applications. Okay, so we're gonna talk about what exactly that means. Um, we have uh, a website, we've got a Slack channel, which is uh, kind of where the primary kind of community stuff happens. Uh, and then of course we're up on GitHub. Uh, and then I just wanted to run through kind of uh, some of the numbers. This is the kind of thing that always makes me uh, feel happy and proud because as an open source, you know, maintainer, th there's really only one reward that you ever get, which is adoption, right? Every other aspect is kind of, <laughs> you know, sometimes it's fun, but it can, it can be, uh, it can be, um, it can be a slog at times, but getting adoption is really the thing that, that makes you feel really excited. So we're about 13 months old. Um, there's around, we've got around 600, uh, over 600 folks in the Slack channel, 1600 GitHub stars. Please keep those coming because that's a total vanity metric that makes me feel happy. Uh, 200,000 Docker Hub pulls, which is not really a measure of anything real, unfortunately. Um, what, what I'm more excited about is we have uh, over 30 contributors, over 20 confirmed uh, companies in production with a lot more in the pipeline getting closer to production. Uh, and we served over 100 billion production requests that we know of. Of course, one of the you know, crazy things about an open source project, you don't really know who's ever, who's ever uh, who actually is using it. I put some of the companies we know about uh, up here. Some of them, I, I put these big censored blocks because there's other companies I'm really excited to talk about uh, coming up, but uh, we're going we're gonna to have a grand uh, reveal a little bit later. Okay, so let's get down to um, you know, what, what, what we're actually talking about. So what is a service mesh? We say Linkerd is a service mesh. A service mesh is a dedicated infrastructure layer for service-to-service -service communication. Okay. And so it's decoupled from the application. I'm going to try my best to minimize this little zoom window here so I can actually read my slides. Um, what's interesting is that I can't see my mouse. So uh, this is <laughs> going to be a little complicated. Uh, let's see. I'm going to, let's see. I'll just try and uh, remember what the words are. Uh, Mark's face is holding, it's kind of hiding some of these words. All right. A dedicated infrastructure. Uh, for service-to-service -service communi communication is decoupled from the application itself and is focused on services and requests. So we've had, you know, obviously we've had communication between things for a very, very long time since kind of the idea of network programming has been invented. So we're not talking here at a service mesh level. We're not talking about service, uh, sorry, we're not talking about TCP packets. We're not talking about IP addresses. Our fundamental nouns are, are services. So service A talks to service B and requests. So I'm sending this request and under the hood there's TCP and there's, you know, there's actual uh, IP addresses and somewhere in here there's physical machines that we don't even know about, um, but those aren't the kind of core nouns and verbs that, that, we're, that we're using, okay? So if you think of where the service mesh sits uh, in kind of the OSI network stack, um, 
you know, traditionally when you when you talk about networking, uh, you know, layers one is layer one is really important, and two is super important, and three is you know, companies are built off of three and four. And then you kind of skip over to layer seven, and like seven, there's a lot of stuff, and you you, you often elide you know, layers five and six. So we're trying to breathe a little more life into this. This is layers five and six is kind of where, especially five, is kind of where the service mesh sits. So it's protocol aware, right? We know enough about the protocol to do stuff, to do intelligent stuff, and I'll talk about what that stuff is. Um, but what we don't know about is a payload. We don't actually care what the payload is. We don't know whether it's JSON or protobuf or, or really, you know, what the application is going to do with it. All right. So, that's where service mesh sits. Now, why do I need one? Okay, you need one. You need one because service-to-service -service communication, which is also called kind of in the bigger enterprise uh, shops, east-west communication, needs to be monitored. Okay, it needs to be managed. It needs to be controlled. You can't, you can't leave it alone. This is something that you now need to deal with. Okay, and I'm gonna, I put this very scary picture up here. This is, I used to, I used to work at Twitter as an engineer there um, till around uh, 2014. And this was a diagram of how the Twitter services communicated with each other, the dependencies between services. I think this is a little bit uh, of a, an exaggeration. I think we overcounted some things here, but this is, you know, this is at least by some view, the view of the service-to-service -service communication that was happening at Twitter, which was one of the uh, earliest kind of very large-scale um, uh, microservice, although we didn't call it at the, at the word at the time, microservice deployments. So this this picture is just to scare you. To scare you, this is why you need to start thinking about this layer um, as, as something that needs to be monitored and managed and controlled because it's really going to be driving a lot of the runtime behavior of your application. Okay, but I've never needed this before. Well, okay, in the past, you don't need this. You don't really need this if you're running a monolith. Okay, you didn't need this before because you weren't running containerized microservices in an orchestrated environment. Now that you are, and it's really the microservices part, I think that's that's the most critical aspect. Containerization uh, is great in a lot of ways, but it's not directly, um, not directly a, a, a prerequisite for this. Um, and the orchestrated environment is, just makes things uh, a little more complicated and makes this a little more valuable. But it's really the fact that you're breaking your application down to services, it just becomes very valuable. So this uh, this is kind of also the motivation for why Linkerd fits into the CNCF, right? Because CNCF, you know, the very definition of, of cloud native you know, is, is uh, containers and, and microservices and orchestrated uh, environment. Any questions from the, any raving questions from the crowd so far, Mark? There are no uh, raving questions. There are also no non-raving questions right now. Okay. All right, well, maybe everyone is being slowly lulled into a, a sense of calm by my voice. It's okay. probably that, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> All right, so, you know, let me just drive home this point a little bit more. So, you know, if, you, if we think about the shift from, from monolithic architectures to microservice architectures, okay, in the monolithic world, we had these things, and I denoted them with little black arrows here. We, we have these things uh, that, are, that we understand very well called function calls, right? So main calls function B, calls function A. Right. And those function calls, we really don't spend a lot of time thinking about them because their performance characteristics are very well understood and very minimal, and their failure characteristics are very well, well understood, which is basically you don't fail a whole lot. Um, you know, unless you're really into kind of very low-level systems programming, you make a function call, you don't really think about it twice. Now, what we've done, at least in the kind of most naive translation in the, in the shift to, to the microservice world, is we've replaced those function calls with now these scary red arrows, which are network calls. And, and not just one network call, but with tens of thousands or hundreds of thousands of network calls all happening concurrently. And those network calls, you know, what do we know about network calls? Well, we know that they fail, and we know that they take a long time, you know, compared to function calls, certainly. Um, so the, the characteristics, the characteristics of of kind of this core, you know, primitive that we're relying on is, is fundamentally very, very different. And that is why we need to measure it, we need to monitor it, and we need to be able to control it. Okay, so let's, let's so that's kind of the setup for how we, for, for, for motivation of why we're talking about, why we're talking about a service mesh, okay? And Linkerd is an implement, implementation of the service mesh. I would argue that actually, going back to my Twitter days, Twitter had a service mesh, you know, we didn't use that term, just like we didn't use the, the term microservices. Um, but, and it, and it had it in a purely library form because Twitter mandated the way that you're gonna write code, you're gonna use this library to handle all your service to service communication. And the library is called Pinnacle. Um, but in, you know, in, in th that has some advantages and has some disadvantages. So Linkerd is an implementation of a, of a service mesh, okay? But the important, the important idea here is this has to be 
like let me go back to this picture for one second this this has to be this service to service communication you know in this new world of containerized microservices running in orchestrated environments it has to be a first class citizen of your environment it has to be something that or first class member of your environment it has to be something that you can look at and that you can monitor and control okay so now finally we're ready to start talking about linkerd um, so how does this work? Like, what is what is what does this thing actually do? What does it look like? Okay, so Linkerd is a process. It's a proxy, actually. It's a proxy. We've had proxies since you know the dawn of time. Um, so it's yet another proxy. But the feature set is is very different, um, and and the focus certainly is very different. So Linkerd is something that you deploy. You deploy you know on a per host basis, or if you're in, in the Kubernetes world, you can deploy it per pod or per host using daemon de de sets. Um, and then it acts as this transparent proxy plus reverse proxy for all these service to service communications. So applications will then, once Linkerd has been deployed, applications will send their HTTP or their gRPC or Thrift or whatever calls through their local Linkerd instance. Okay, and Linkerd will take care of everything else. So it takes care of service discovery, takes care of load balancing, takes care of um, reliability, takes care of instrumentation, takes care of everything. Uh, and I'll talk in gory detail about what those, what those things are. Um, and, and how Linkerd accomplishes them. But the, the core goal here is that the application shouldn't actually care. The application shouldn't even know that Linkerd is there. So if we do this right, if this is right, the application is totally decoupled from Linkerd. Linkerd is just part of the underlying infrastructure. All right, so far so good? Everyone is silent, which I think means total comprehension. Excellent, wow, that's uh, usually how this goes with me. All right, so let's take a look, you know, let's stare at this picture for a moment and just ah, enjoy, enjoy it. So this is kind of a little deployment diagram of how it might be on something like, you know, if you're using Kubernetes, something like a service mesh. So you have pods representing certain, you know, individual services, service A, B, and C, they'd be deployed, you know, Kubernetes would kind of manage where those things go, Linkerd would be deployed as a, as a daemon set, and the services would just, rather than communicating directly, so rather than service A talking to service B um, directly, you know, and doing a DNS lookup and making a connection and dealing with its own retries and timeouts and whatever else, it would just talk to localhost 1234 and treat that as an HTTP proxy. And, and if we get to the demo, and if the demo is successful, I'll show you, you know, kind of very, in very concrete terms what that looks like. But ideally, like I said, service A doesn't actually care about the fact that Linkerd is there, and you may not even have to make a code change to use it. And then the other point, you know, the other thing to, to Notice here, as I talked about Linkerd being acting both as a proxy and as a reverse proxy. So what you'll see is that Linkerds actually don't talk directly to the destination instance; they talk to each other. Okay, and then and then talk to the destination. Okay, so we're actually introducing two network ops. The network engineers in the room are probably freaking out um, because we've introduced two user space network ops, you know, to every service to service communication. This actually actually makes things faster. Makes things faster because, okay, well, let's, let's qualify that, okay, because clearly like adding more hops doesn't really make things faster. But it makes things faster because we can reduce tail latencies. We can reduce tail latencies by being intelligent about the way that we load balance and the way that we do um, flow control in between Linkerd. So your, worst, your best case behavior, sorry, your best case performance, service A talking to service B, does take a hit. Right, your best case performance, you know, you're gonna spend a millisecond in Linkerd and another millisecond in the other Linkerd and you've got some trans, transit time in between. Um, your best case behavior takes a hit. Your worst case behavior gets improved by the way that Linkerd can manage these connections, okay? And that's actually what you care about in a big distributed system. You wanna reduce your tail latencies, and we can do that. Okay, um, and then this service, uh, sorry, this, this linker to linker model here has a whole bunch of nice benefits. We do this for a reason. Okay, so let's talk about some of the things that Linkerd actually does. William, sorry, we yes, have sir. a question. Can we just skip back a slide? Yeah. So Erin asks, um, so each host is doing service discovery. Is there a shared status for availability of the backend or is every instance of Linkerd responsible, responsible for its own check? Yeah, that's a really good question. It's the Linkerd instances are decoupled and they don't talk to each other uh, for metadata reasons. So each Linkerd instance is making its own, is keeping its own stats of on a per instance basis uh, which is, you know, which instances are alive, which ones are fast, which ones are slow. So we fully distribute that decision-making power. So I'm assuming that means the status is not shared. So Aaron then says, uh, if the status is not shared, at what point do you hit a size limit? 
a size limit for um, for for what for number of instances? I'm assuming it's number of Linkerd instances, but uh, Aaron, maybe you could drop something else in the chat there to just clarify. Yeah. So the, uh, while he's doing that, I'll say you know we we purposely do not want the Linkerd instances to to be kind of tightly coupled to each other, to, even to really know about where the other ones are, except kind of when they're making a direct connection. We want these things to be stateless and we want them to be independent um, so that they're very easy to deploy. Uh, and also it's helpful, I think, in some cases because you may have very different latency profiles on different nodes, right? Different nodes could have different performance characteristics. They could be in different parts of, you know, the, the network kind of topology. Um, so having distributed state, I think, makes a lot of sense. Okay, I think that answers it. Uh, if not, Aaron, let me know and we'll come back to it later in the webinar. Thanks, William. Yeah, uh, so in, in summary, these Linkerd instances are stateless and they're independent uh, of each other, so deployment becomes very easy. We do, in advanced usage, we do start centralizing some of these things, so you actually do want centralized control over bits of these things, um, and I'll talk about that as we, as we go on. Okay, so what does it do? Let's, let's actually look at some examples. Okay, so what does Linkerd do? Why am I using this? Why am I adding this other like piece to my, to my, you know, to my um, infrastructure stack? Um, so I'll, I'll list out a couple things. So the one thing it does is it just adds reliability primitives, okay? So it does load balancing and it does it in a latency aware way. So that means that as particular instances are slowing down, it'll shift traffic away from them. As they start speeding back up, it'll send traffic to them, okay? It can, it can do that because it's operating at layer five right, in our OSI model. So it actually is aware of individual requests. So I can actually create a, a latency profile and I can keep that up to date based on observed performance of individual instances and I can, you know, optimize my traffic that way. Okay, it does circuit breaking in a very similar way. If a host or if a particular instance is responding really, really quickly, but is throwing 500s, you know, okay, great. The latency, you know, the latency-based load balancing, it's like, oh, this guy's great, you know, but it's actually returning 500s the whole time. Well, circuit breaking can be aware of that layer, you know, of that level of errors and can just kick it out of the pool and say, hey, it's not even worth talking to this guy. It does retries, so it'll manage retries for you, and it does it using, it parameterizes it using budgets rather than um, retry policies, and I'll talk about that in a second. That's, that's actually quite important. And we can do things like deadlines. Uh, again, I think I'll talk about that in, in a minute. Deadline propagation um, instead of a lot, instead of setting, uh, explicit timeouts of each step in the hub. Um, more importantly, it decouples the transport protocol from the application protocol. Okay, so the application could be speaking HTTP 1, you know, but the linker D instances could be talking HTTP 2 to each other. So we can upgrade. Um, uh, a similar upgrade uh, that's actually quite quite common is to wrap things in TLS. So the Linkerd instances, you know, are both initiating and terminating TLS. And so in, in Kubernetes, it's actually quite nice because Kubernetes guarantees that um, pod, you know, that, that talking to your daemon set will happen over localhost. So that communication can be unencrypted and linker to linker communication can be encrypted and then you can have uh, automatic cross node uh, TLS. Um, so that's another form of, of protocol upgrade. Um, and then finally, it gives us this way of doing sanitized naming. So it decouples this idea of like, what's the, what's the service name kind of in my head when I'm thinking about the architecture versus what's the service name that's actually been deployed, right? And in our head, when we're thinking about this thing in the shower, we're like we're trying to you know, reason about the application, uh, you know, we're, we're thinking about the user service. Right, it's called it's, it's the user service. But in, in production, when we're actually deploying this thing, well, we might have different data centers. You know, a staging cluster versus a, a prod cluster versus a test cluster versus something else. We might have different versions of the user service running concurrently if we're doing blue green deploys. So Linkerd gives you this principled and consistent way of doing that mapping between those two. So the application then stays very pure. You know, I'm, I just want to talk to the user service, so I'll say connect me to users, and Linkerd will uh, translate that into what the actual production you know, destination is. And that mapping is, is very powerful. Uh, if we have time, I'll give some examples of that. That's kind of the core routing logic and it's able to be changed on the fly. So you can change the routing logic dynamically. And there's cool stuff you can do as a result of that. Okay, uh, let's see, a couple more cool things we can do. Logical routing and traffic shifting. This is kind of what I was talking about before. Because we have this routing layer translating from concrete names to abstract names, I'm sorry, from abstract names to concrete names, we can, and we can change it at the fly, we can do all sorts of fancy stuff there uh, in terms of traffic shifting. We can shift traffic based on percentages and things like that. Um, it gives you, because it's abstracting away the access to service discovery, it actually gives you this way of gluing together things like Kubernetes with 
you know, existing systems. If you have something running on Zookeeper or another system or Marathon or, or console, well, you can tie all those things together. Linkerd can actually talk to multiple service discovery systems and you can express kind of the precedence between them. And then again, the application is totally unaware. The application says, okay, I just want to talk to the user service and Linkerd will find out what that actually means and will proxy that regardless of whether that destination service is in the same you know, environment or not. Um, you can extend that same model to fi failover and hybrid cloud. I'm not gonna talk a whole lot about that. Um, and then we have consistent, this is kind of the nice part is you have consistent global metrics across everything. So if you're living in a polyglot environment, this is something that's really hard to do because you have to keep your frameworks and your, and your different languages all up to date. So if you want, you know, if you want success rates, well, you need to have a way of doing that, you know, on kind of an application level basis per framework or per language with Linkerd. Uh, because we're sitting at layer five and measuring requests, we actually know what the success rate is and we know what the latencies are. So out of the box, you get consistent metrics uniform across your entire um, application stack, regardless of what language is the service over. And I, that's probably the easiest thing to demo, so I should be able to show that pretty quick. Okay, and then, but Kubernetes already has load balancing and service discovery and all sorts of stuff. Um, yes, it does. It's at a different layer in the stack. Um, you know, load balancing, Kubernetes load balancing is layer four, and what we're doing is request load balancing at layer five, and so on. So th this stuff is a little confusing, I think, especially if you're getting started. We have an excellent series of blog posts that I'm gonna just point you to. If you search for, you know, Kubernetes service mesh, you'll get this whole long laundry list of, um, of blog posts where we have specific examples and like commands you can run, and Kubernetes config things you can, you can try um, to deploy Linkerd and to do a bunch of different stuff. So, uh, if you want to learn more, this is uh, a great way to get started. Okay, so let's see. Um, I do have some examples, and then I think we probably should have enough time for that. So I'll run through a couple examples, and then uh, we'll do the demo at the end. Any questions before I get started, Mark? There are no questions so far. All right, good. So here we go. All right, so let's take, I, I mentioned briefly, I mentioned briefly that um, we did deadlines rather than timeouts. So let's take a look at what that means. Okay, so here's kind of the classic setup, right? You're making a bunch of services. I've got a web service, talks to a timeline service, it talks to a user service, which then talks to a database. And I've got some uh, timeout and retry, you know, policies that I put on here. And this is, you know, kind of where you start. This is what I call the web browser based model of, of communication. How does your web browser talk to the web server? Well, you know, talks to the server and the server doesn't respond in 400 milliseconds and I'll try again. And then, you know, if it doesn't respond after three times and I just give up, okay? But the problem is when you're doing this for service to service communication, okay, you've got multiple hops here, these timeouts and these retries don't actually compose well, okay? So what is the end-to-end -end behavior here? What's gonna happen? All right, well, let's take a look. Let's say the database starts slowing down and we hit a timeout in the user service and we start retrying, okay? Well, the user service could potentially take up to 600 milliseconds. All right, and once you hit 600 milliseconds, well, now you've triggered a timeout on the timeline service. And the timeline service is gonna retry, and that could potentially take up to 800 milliseconds. And now you've triggered timeouts in the web service. So now you have this kind of cascading level of not only a, a, a failed requests, but you're actually adding way more load to the system because you're doing a bunch of retries that you don't need to do, okay? And, and this is something that we ran into at Twitter all the time. It's really hard to reason about timeouts and retry logic when you have multiple hops. Okay, so instead, if we instead parameterize things by deadlines, okay, we set a top level deadline. We can say, hey, your timeout is, you know, your, your top level deadline, it's a timeout here, but it should be 400 milliseconds. It should say deadline. Uh, your top level deadline is 400 milliseconds. That means you've got 400 milliseconds to make this request happen. And if it doesn't happen, then, you know, within 400 milliseconds, and just stop there. Okay, and then you get to the first hop and you just subtract, you know, how much time has elapsed. And you get to the next hop and you subtract how much time has elapsed. You get to the third hop. And so Linkerd can propagate these deadlines um, and then it can cut off, it can cut off the request, right, if, if, if we've exceeded the deadline. And now you have something that you can reason about uh, in a much more sane way. Okay, so we've talked about timeouts and deadlines. Let's talk about retries, okay? So one of the problems we saw on that previous slide is that the worst case behavior, if you're doing retries on a per request basis, the worst case behavior is actually quite bad, right? If you have three retries, you're saying, okay, worst case behavior, I actually want you to add 300% more load to the system. Well, that's gonna be problematic, right? Because the, how do computers work? Well, the more load that you put on them, the worse they get, 
Okay, so now we've just exacerbated a system, at, you know, that that already was starting to slow down. Well, now it's just pounded it with with three hundred percent more load. Um, so this is the the off uh, referred to retry storms. Okay, so what if instead of parameterizing it as a per request policy, we we instead say, hey, we'll give you a retry budget. Okay, so your budget is twenty percent, right? That means a linkerd up to 20% of your total requests can be retries. And if you exceed that, then you're not allowed to do any more than just start failing there. Then our worst case behavior is 20% more load. Okay, now we have a much saner system. So this is the sort of stuff that, uh, you know, that, that, that linkerd can do. You can do all this stuff in your application. It's a little difficult to get right, um, or you can defer it to, to, to linkerd. Um, it actually gets, Quite complicated to get right when you start thinking about the interactions between load balancing and circuit breaking and service discovery and a couple other things here. Um, but you know, I, I think ultimately, you know, the goal is all this complicated logic should be part of the underlying infrastructure because it's not critical. It's critical to 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 the way that your application behaves at runtime. Okay, I also mentioned briefly request level load balancing. Um, so because we're observing the latency and the and the success rate of individual requests. Um, we can be intelligent about how we balance load, and, and we have a blog post where we kind of played around with some of these different metrics under the conditions of, you know, slow instances, or sudden slowdowns, and things like that. Uh, and we can show that, you know, by being aware of latency, as you might expect, by being aware of the latency of individual instances, um, you can get much better uh, performance when things start slowing down. And that's important because things always start slowing down, right? You're in the cloud now. You don't have any. You don't have any guarantees about what your hardware is doing. It could be another tenant there who's, you know, stealing all your resources. Um, so there's kind of a broader point here, uh, which I'm, which I haven't really made, but there's kind of a broader point, which is that being cloud native, right? Being software that's designed for cloud is fundamentally about being, fundamentally about being, uh, able to survive kind of the partial failures and the total lack of guarantees that we have on kind of the foundational elements of like the, the services and the hosts and, and the instances that we're running on, right? Because the cloud gives us very few guarantees. Okay. All right. And then finally, why is this thing called Linkerd? You know, why, why do we call it this, you know, linking daemon, right? Why, what does it do to link? Okay. So we actually took inspiration from um, this model in the operating system of a linker um, that that uh, gets that 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 runs when you when you're running an executable, you're running a binary, and it uses shared libraries, dynamic libraries. Okay, so the basic job here's a book you know that we took a screenshot of. So this is how we do research. The basic job of a linker or a loader is simple: it binds more abstract names onto more concrete names. Right. So you, as a programmer, don't have to worry about you know where get line is. Right. You just invoke it. And the linker kind of figures it out. Similarly, we have this, you know, idea in in uh, in in the cloud native world of you as a service. And I kind of alluded to this when I was talking about abstract names and concrete names before. You as a service shouldn't really care where something is. You just want to make the request. Okay. So in this in this case, you know, in this little diagram here, I'm the timeline service, and I want to talk to the user service. Well, which one do I care? Mm, I mean, which, which which one do I want to talk to? Well, that shouldn't really be a decision that's in the application code. Right, that should be handled by the underlying infrastructure. So we can bind those requests. In fact, we can do fancy stuff and bind it per um, on a per request basis. So we can not only say, "Hey, timeline, you know, I, hey, I, I, you know, I'm doing a blue green deploy between users and users, users v1 and users v2, and I want everyone to start shifting the traffic over. All of the upstream clients to start shifting the traffic over. We can actually do it on a per request basis. We can say, "Hey, for this individual request, I want you to go through the production topology." Okay, but instead of talking to the user service, I want you to talk to users, uh, users v2. So we can give you mechanisms for doing staging and canaring. And if you look at the blog posting uh, list in the previous slide, we, we have some good examples of this. Okay, so again, this is kind of uh, just driving home the, the point about logical names versus concrete names. And the fact that the mapping between those two is called, is called routing. Okay, and I talked about per request routing. Um, I'll just run through this uh, briefly because I want to get to the demo. Um, you know, uh, one example of this is to say, hey, I've got my new instance 
you know, of service B, I'm, I'm trying something, okay, I think I've got a bug fix or I've got a new feature. I just want to send one request through it. Well, can I send that request through the production topology, except instead of talking directly to service B, can I talk to, you know, B prime over here? And can I just do it for this one request? So we can do that with the per request routing policy. Um, you know, another good use case is for injecting debug proxies. Okay, the way that these two services are talking to each other in production is, is something screwy there. I want to see what's going on there. On, on a per request basis, we can give you a way of injecting a little debug proxy in between these two things. Um, and then you can actually, uh, you know, without having to deploy stuff, you can get insight into, into uh, uh, what the actual, you know, I don't know, this proxy can be whatever you want. Um, you can use this for, for failure injection too. Okay, so these are kind of some of the, the, the advanced features. Once you have this consistent layer that Linkerd gives you of, of, of routing and of request level routing, there's a lot of cool stuff you can do. Okay, so that's kind of the end of, you know, my talking part. And uh, the next bit is for me to desperately try and do some typing and see what happens. We've got some questions before you do Great. that. Yeah, let's do it. Um, okay, from Aaron. Uh, does Linkerd actually handle the service discovery portion? And if not, how do people handle that when using Linkerd? So that's a great question. What Linkerd does is uh, it can talk to an existing service discovery system. Okay, so you can tell it, uh, I've got console running over here, I've got Zookeeper over here, I've got um, you know the Kubernetes API, which is also service discovery over here. Okay, and so. Linkerd is doing service discovery in the sense that like it can talk to these things and kind of merge them together. Um, but it's not storing that service discovery data. We assume that there's some service discovery system under the hood. And so if you're just using, you know, for, if you're just using Kubernetes, well, you would just configure it to talk to the Kubernetes API. Understood. Uh, next up, Ismo asks, does Linkerd make HA proxy obsolete? Does it make HA proxy obsolete? Uh, I think there's still a lot of good use cases for HA proxy. One, well, so no, no, I don't, I don't think so. Um, there's a couple things that, well, eh, maybe in the future we will. I don't know. I think in the future we will. Right now, one big thing that we don't have, uh, although this is going to change pretty soon, that we don't have is pure TCP proxy, right? So everything that Linkerd does is really focused on. Um, it's really focused on request level stuff. So we can't even take a, we can't really take a raw TCP stream and, and just proxy that across. That's actually something we're working on. Maybe once we have that, we'll make it obsolete. Uh, I've got a nice easy question for you and then one from me. Um, oh. <laughs> oh no, another one, another one just came in. Uh, Niatu asks, uh, William, do you plan to share your slides? Uh, yeah, I'll definitely share these. Cool, so I'll get those from William. And when we upload the video uh, and push it to YouTube, I'll make sure that it's in the description there. Um, and then the one that just came in, Aaron asks, you talked about updating Linkerd for debugging purposes. How does Linkerd handle that update? So uh, are you referring to this debug proxy back here? Yeah, I'm pretty sure it's where you injected a proxy to pull out server yeah. requests. Yeah, yeah, okay. So in this case, actually, the, the, this, this proxy would be some other proxy that, that, that you wrote. Okay, so what I'm doing here is allowing you to insert some service in between, you know, in between calls and some existing production topology. Um, so this is, the, the use case here is, uh, you know, I want to see what's happening between, so this little P, you know, in this diagram, it's not actually Linkerd, it's like something that you wrote. Um, so, you know, the use case is I want to inject this proxy in between these two existing production systems to just capture some of the traffic and see what's happening or to modify some of the traffic. You know, or to inject failures or something like that. Does that make Got sense? It. Well, there's a follow-up question. Yeah, it does make okay. sense. There's a follow-up question, and there's more questions coming in now. Um, so Aaron follows up with, "Can it do hot restarts without dropping packets?" Uh, that's a good question. It can gracefully shut down. It cannot do a hot restart because we don't actually like that pattern very much. So what we prefer to do is move more and more of the configuration into kind of an external service. So we do this, like the routing policy is, is the first thing that we've done with this. Um, so routing policy, we actually, if you look in the Linkerd project, we have this other little uh, binary or little entry point called Namerd. And Namerd is a routing policy store. It's actually a little bit more than that. Um, so if you want to change routing policy across your entire fleet of Linkerds, you would, change it in Namerd and each of the Linkerd instances would be listening 
to, to NamerD and would update their policy accordingly. So our, our preference basically is to never have to restart Linkerd unless you're like upgrading Linkerd and instead to move all of the config that you might want to change into a separate service. Right. Um, Aaron says, great, thanks. So apparently you answered that question correctly. Uh, okay, I was going to ask you, how does this compare to Hystrix? But then v Vijish uh, jumped in and stole my question with a better one. <laughs> which is, uh, he says, first time into Linkerd, but who would you say are competitors in the domain? And how does Linkerd excel above those if there are any? Oh, man. Wow. That's a tough so, one. That's a big one. <laughs> yeah, you know, I think generally as an open source project, uh, I'm, I'm reluctant to use the word competitor because we don't sell Linkerd, so if someone uses something else, it's not like I've, I've lost, you know, that's five dollars that are gone out of my pocket. Mm -hmm. uh, and generally, I like the idea of there being kind of a thriving ecosystem of like projects all doing cool stuff because it's good, you know, it's good, it's good for the world. So uh, I'll instead, I won't answer the competitor question. I'll, I'll instead answer what are other projects in the space that could that that you could look at. Um, there's certainly a lot of proxies out there. Traffic is one that's very popular um, in the Kubernetes community. Nginx is one. Um, there's a project from Lyft called Envoy, um, and I think Uber had one at some point called Hyper uh, called Hyperbond, but I don't know if it became like open sourced. Um, there's also things like Kong, which is an API gateway, but uh, you know it's, it's effectively a proxy that mm -hmm. does things like rate limiting. So there's really there's a lot of projects in this ecosystem. They each have kind of a slightly different take on on what they're trying to accomplish. Um, why is Linkerd better than all of them? Well, it's got the best logo for one. <laughs> uh, so I'm going to skip ahead a few questions and then come back just because you brought up uh, Envoy. I thought it would be Envoy. Envoy? I don't know how you said it. Anyway, uh, Nia, nu, nu, Nuatu says, uh, I know Envoy, the Envoy project from Lyft aims to fit a similar space and is built in C++ to be designed for low resource utilization. What's your take? on the resource footprint yeah resource so resource footprint is definitely something that uh we are continually improving we have some uh actually if you make it to to kubecon uh next week uh and watch oliver's uh uh linkerd keynote we'll have some good news uh, along this front uh, but yeah i mean ideally uh something like this which sits at the infrastructure layer you know should not be should not take up should not be resource hungry yeah. so got it it's definitely something that we need to continue to improve um and Vajish asked another question which is what is the name of this ecosystem by the way i'm assuming it means this this slice of the stack i think we're referring to it as service mesh the service mesh that's the best name that i've come up with it you know part of the problem is that we've had proxies since the beginning of time you know, so just calling it a proxy kind of, I don't think it's quite as useful. I think service mesh is really the, the best term, but that's still a pretty young term. So you search for service mesh now, mostly you find a lot of references to a company called service mesh whose CEO got in trouble. That wasn't me, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> All right, skipping back up the list again. We've got um, a game from Nuatu. Uh, what local disk requirements does Linkerd ask of the machine it runs on? Does it create a local DB instance on each separate process? No. No, it doesn't do anything with the disk. Okay, that's very clear. Next, can you speak briefly how about how light or heavy the JVM-based Linkerd is? How much JVM or general systems host tuning operators? Uh, wait a minute, let me reread that. Uh, uh, how much JVM or general systems slash host tuning should operators anticipate having to do? Yeah, so we spent a bunch of time on this. Um, Basically, in our experiments, if you're running kind of a non-crazy amount of uh, requests through Linkerd, so under a thousand requests per second, uh, we can squeeze it down to about 100, 105 megs, um, and not an extreme amount of, of, of CPU usage. That's under the current architecture. There's some things we're going to do that will significantly improve that. Um, you shouldn't have to do any real tuning of this thing. Uh, unless you're getting to very, very high workloads. So, you know, in our experiments, we got up to around 40,000 requests per second through a single Linkerd instance, which point I think we 
saturated the, the network connection. Um, and we had to do a little bit of tuning um, to get there. But basically, unless you're at high workloads, you shouldn't have to do a lot of tuning. We want this, we don't want this to be a thing that you worry about, you know, it's, it's, the goal is for it to come shipped out of the box as something that's lightweight and performant and, you know, you install it as a, as a Docker container or something and you don't really have to look at what's, you know, the gory details underneath the hood. Of course, that's not always true in practice. Operate, operate, uh, productionization, operationalization uh, is always difficult. Excellent. Uh, we've got two, two more. Uh, Thomas says, is the recommended approach for implementing Linkerd on Kubernetes either A, by the sidecar approach, or B, by a daemon set? I've found that the sidecar approach has had trouble coming back up during an auto scale on Kubernetes, which doesn't appear to be a problem with the daemon set approach. I don't know why sidecar would have that particular problem. We haven't done a whole lot with auto scaling, but I don't, I don't know why sidecar would be that bad. Uh, our preference right now is daemon sets simply because of the resource utilization question. It's easier, especially if you have lots of pods on your machine, it's easier to scale you know, Linkerd one per node rather than one per pod. Uh, but that's really mostly a question of, of uh, amortizing resource cost. Okay, Nia, uh, before we get into the last question, Nuatu, who you answered two or three questions for, said, great, I appreciate the answers, very clear, appreciate it for yeah. sure. I will experiment with it on Kafka and Kubernetes based system and maybe blog about it, thanks. Awesome, well, let us know, hop into the Slack and uh, we'll help you if you get stuck on anything. We've got a good community of very excited and engaged users. Awesome. Uh, last question then, unless anyone sticks another one in while I'm asking this one, uh, from Berman. Um, is anyone, or are you aware of anyone, I guess the question is, are you aware of anyone using Linkerd with console in production? And then yes. the implicit question is, can you say who? <laughs> um, I'm definitely aware of people doing this. Can I say who? That's, I don't know. Uh, if you ping me on the Slack or, or send me a Twitter DM, at WM, I'll tell you kind of one-on-one. -on -one. I don't know what the rules are. We, we get exposed to a lot of people's, you know, internals, and I'm not never really sure what's public and what's not. But yes, there's definitely multiple Linkerd plus console production users that I can point you to. Um, I'd just rather do it privately. Awesome. Uh, so the questions seem to have quietened down for now, which means we've got exactly 14 minutes for you to give us a demo. Okay, well, let's try it. All right, so here we are. Uh, Mark, can you see the screen? Everything look okay to you? Looks great. Okay, so here's, here's what we're gonna do. And this is gonna be interesting. I used to give a lot of demos uh, with, with Docker Compose. And what was weird was, uh, I'm sorry, this was, uh, and, and Docker for Mac. What was weird was that when I tried it at home, Docker for Mac, you know, everything worked perfectly. As soon as I started giving a demo, it would crash. And what I realized was that uh, the video conferencing software was taking up so much resources that, Docker, that it would cause Docker for Mac to crash. So we're gonna see this was worked perfectly at home. Um, I'm using Minikube in this case, um, but we'll see what happens when I've got the, you know, the webinar software running. All right, so here's what I'm gonna do. Uh, so I actually have a little, um, uh, Minikube instance running. It doesn't have anything on it right now. Let me go, uh, I'll show you what this little dashboard uh, looks like. So here's what my little Kubernetes Minikube looks like. It's got nothing on it. I'm gonna um, add a bunch of things. So let's see, uh, let's add, first thing I'm gonna do is add Linkerd. Okay, and this, uh, by the way, this repo is available on GitHub. So if you go to uh, github.com slash buoyant.io, there's a Linkerd examples repo. Um, and you can go to this directory here and kind of follow along at, at home. Okay, so there's Linkerd. I'm gonna, uh, let's see, also in, install something called, uh, let's see, Linkerd, no, that was it. Um, uh, fly F, where is it, there we go. Okay, Linkerd Viz, I'll show you what that looks like uh, in a bit. Okay, so that's kind of, I've, I've now deployed Linkerd to the Kubernetes cluster and I've deployed, deployed this other thing called Linkerd Viz, which is actually, I'll show you, it's gonna be a little Prometheus instance that's, that's configured to, to look at Linkerd. And I'm gonna deploy my very simple hello world application. Um, and let's see, apply, 
uh, uh, where is it? Okay, there's the world service. And then I have a hello service somewhere. There we go. Okay, so that should be good. And then if we look at uh, what our Kubernetes service uh, or a little Kubernetes cluster looks like. Let's see what happens. Everything work? It's gonna be a very quick demo if not. Okay, there we go. All right, so we've got uh, Linkerd running as a daemon set. We've got Linkerd viz running just as a, as a service somewhere. Um, and we have a hello service, which is my application and the world service. So this is my very simple hello world microservice system. We have a hello service that talks to the world service and the world service returns the string world and the hello service takes that string and append and prepends the string hello, okay? So, so far so good, right? Everything's running. Okay, so, there's, so how do we use this thing? How do we use this thing in, 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 in real life? So let's see, I'm gonna do, um, the very first thing I'm gonna do is I'm gonna take one of these, I'm gonna get the IP address of one of these Linkerd instances. Okay, so this is, in this case, Minikube, I think is only running on one node, so this is mildly silly, but here I'm taking an arbitrary, let's just pretend I've got a cluster you know, of, of, of 50 machines. I'm taking an arbitrary Linkerd instance. And what I can do now is I can actually use curl to talk to this instance and show off some of the service discovery stuff. So um, let's look at, um, let's find a good command here. Okay, so here I am, I'm using curl. Let's, let's, let's unpack this for a second. I'm using curl and I'm telling it to talk to HTTP colon slash slash hello. Okay, so this is the name of the hello service. It's gonna go through Linkerd's routing. Uh, it's gonna go through, um, through those routing rules. It's gonna end up in a service discovery lookup on the Kubernetes API and it's gonna find a, a hello instance and it's gonna proxy the request. It's gonna handle any retries. And it's gonna return that result back to me. And what you'll notice is that I'm using this HTTP proxy environment variable here. This is a very easy way of saying, hey, curl, and actually this works with almost every C program, Ruby, Python, Go, they all understand these environment variables. I'm saying, hey, curl, you know, when you make this call, don't, don't do a DNS lookup, right? You talk through this proxy, all right? And when I run this command, what we'll see is, all right, whew, glad that worked. Hello world, okay, and I'm actually putting the IP address, the pod IP of, of these instances. If we run this again, we should get slightly different IP addresses, no? Okay, there we go. Okay, so this is not using DNS at all, and that's important because DNS is actually horrible in, in production when things are moving very, very rapidly. If you have experience with large-scale distributed systems that try to use DNS for service discovery, you'll, you'll realize you quickly run into a bunch of problems. Okay, so. The system works. We're able to access the hello service from anywhere in the service mesh. We can do a similar thing, just to, just to kind of show you, we can do a similar thing with um, the world service. So if we just wanted to talk to world directly, and we'll see that, okay, that's what the world service responds with. Okay, great. So let's actually pump a little traffic through here and I'll show off some of the metrics. All right, so here we are. I'm just gonna curl hello over and over again. Okay, and we'll see how fast my little laptop can can run here and then uh actually before i do that before i do that let me let me do i'm going to open up uh two dashboards um maybe that's uh over here oh sorry um where is it i have this in my history somewhere okay so here we are Okay, there we go. So this is gonna open up, sorry, I have to find the right command here. This is gonna open up the Linkerd dashboard. Okay, and while that's opening up, I'll actually do um, the Linkerd viz dashboard too, and we can kind of compare and contrast these two things. Let me run a little traffic through here too. That's taking a while. There we go. Okay, my poor little laptop is struggling under this. All right, here we go. So let's take a look at the Linkerd dashboard first of all. Okay, so here I am, I'm looking at the dashboard of an individual Linkerd instance. Okay, and I can see there's a couple things going on right off the bat. First of all, I have some traffic going through the system. Okay, and it's this yellow line here. There actually is a little purple line that's hidden behind there. Uh, if if uh, the random numbers play out, we'll, we'll see it in a second. Okay, and I've got these two clients here. Okay, I've got one that's called hello, and one that's called world v1. 
okay? And so this is Linkerd's view of the world is saying, hey, I've looked at these two things in service discovery, I'm proxying requests to them. You can see I'm getting about, you know, maybe one request a second through here. Um, and okay, there's the purple line there. So we can see the traffic is going to both of these two services. I've got latency profiles here, doesn't look too good. Um, and I've got success rates here. All right, so both of these are responding at 100%. So good, good for us, we, we wrote some good code. And uh, we can see there's a retry budget, which we haven't quite used, and we're only talking to one endpoint right now. Okay, so, so far so good. Linkerd seems to be happy. So let's actually do something. In this other terminal, what I'm gonna do is, um, I am going to, first let me get the right IP address. I'm going to send a command to one of the instances of the world service, and I'm gonna tell this world service to start failing. I'm gonna start failing at like 20%. Once Minikube gets his act together. All right, so, okay. So here I am, I'm sending a command to one of those instances to say I want, of, of the world service, to say I want you to fail. Okay, so what we should see if the demo gods are with us is this line here, this client success line should start dropping. So we should see some dips, there we go, as one of those instances starts responding with failures, okay? Uh, I actually can't see that line because Mark's head is, is in the way. <laughs> okay, there we go, yeah, so it is failing. Phew. Great, okay, so what's interesting now is even though traffic is going through here, uh, you know, and one of these instances is failing, we're actually getting 100% success rate on the outgoing service here, all right? So because Linkerd, in this case, we've configured it with a retry budget, and we've also told it, hey, by the way, these are uh, HTTP commands, and they or HTTP requests, and they conform to standard HTTP verb semantics, right? Then Linkerd knows, okay, gets are retriable, posts are not, puts our retriable, deletes or not. Okay, we just saw that, you know, it used some of that retry budget. Okay, so even though we have an instance here that's failing, our outgoing success rate is still at 100% because Linkerd is able to retry automatically. And we can do a similar game, I'm not gonna do it now um, since we only have a couple minutes left, we can play a similar game with latency where we can have one of these instances start slowing down and Linkerd will gracefully shift traffic to, to um, to uh, different instances. So Linkerd is, this is kind of some of the core reliability primitives. The application is quite dumb. It's saying, hey, I'm HTTP, you know, uh, sorry, I, I, you know, it's saying, actually I can show you what it's saying. It's saying literally, like I wanna talk to HTTP colon slash slash world, just like we were doing with curl. Um, and Linkerd is taking care of the rest and it's just making a single request and not worrying about retries. Okay, and then I just wanted to show off briefly here, we have this thing called uh, uh, Linkerd Fizz, which is just a fancy name for Prometheus with like kind of some pre-configured um, uh, dashboards to detect the Linkerd instances. And what we can see is we're getting success rates, and this is across our whole cluster. So we're getting success rates and we're getting latencies on a per service basis across our entire cluster. So we didn't actually know this before, right? We didn't know anything about these services. And these services are written in whatever language they're written in, or whatever framework they are, but because we have the Linkerd service mesh everywhere, they get consistent uh, and uniform metrics across everything. And we get the metrics that we really care about, which are things like success rate and request uh, request volume and request latencies. Okay, so since we're near the end, I'm gonna pause here for you know last accolades or questions. Yes. <laughs> much, much more we could be doing at this point. Um, so I encourage you to check out that Linkerd examples repo or to follow along on some of the blog posts. You can run this stuff just like me in the privacy of your own home. So, um, no accolades coming through yet. That's a gentle nudge to the people listening. Um, we do have one big question though, and it comes in pretty much essay format. So I'm gonna try to read it correctly. Okay. 120 seconds to answer it. All right, I'm ready. A game from Aaron. Aaron says, uh, now trying to be more clear about my earlier question. So say I have 500 hosts running service A. Service A passes data to linker D, which then passes the data to service B running on different hosts. Linker D on each service A host is doing status checks to ensure that service B is available. Do you have an idea at what scale, i.e. how many service A hosts you can get to before you should really shard out to service A1, service B1, service A2 to service B2, et cetera? Okay, so this is a question of like how many concurrent instances uh, could an individual Linkerd, individual, sorry, how many concurrent like uh, service instances could an individual Linkerd, you know, kind of keep in its load balancing pool? Right. That's a good question. Uh, I could make something up, but that's really a question for Oliver, my, my, my co-founder who, who writes the code. Um, my guess would be it'd be 
quite large, that's usually not the thing that starts failing. Uh, that's usually not the, the, the kind of the stress point for Linkerd. Um, but uh, Aaron, I'd encourage you to hop into the Linkerd Slack and just ask Oliver directly. Cool, thanks. And we've got some, uh, Aaron says, um, no worries. Uh, figured it was so, but just curious if you knew. So Aaron, you can go and jump in the Linkerd Slack and find out some uh, answers there. In the it's not like 10, right? It's, it's like, it's a <laughs> large number. It's a big number. Um, we've got John saying, great webinar. Thanks, David. Fantastic, great content. Looking forward to getting more familiar with Linkerd and all sorts of other things coming through. I want to thank all of you for attending and uh, coming up with all these interesting questions. Uh, I want to thank you, William, for a very entertaining webinar. Thank you very much of for it. Of course, it was my pleasure. Last but not least, I want to remind everyone that um, Oliver, right? That's your partner. That's right. Oliver will be at Cloud Native Con Berlin next week with um, many sessions, it sounds like. So if you're interested in speaking to someone face to face, take a look at the um, schedule and track him down. That's all we've got time for for now. Thank you very much and goodbye.